Thank you. It's my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to another in our series of distinguished lectures presented by the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Core Texts and Ideas. That's the new Great Books program here at the University of Texas. Uh, for those of you who aren't so familiar with it or would like to learn more about it, there are some brochures on the table there by the door, and you can pick those up as you go out if you would like. And before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to announce that our undergraduate book club uh, will be holding a meeting discussing a short text of Rousseau next week, his famous preface to Narcisse, his play. And we'll be meeting Thursday, that's February 18th, at 5 o'clock on the fifth floor of Bats Hall, right uh, next door. Uh, and anyone who'd like to learn more about the book club could see uh, Matthew Levinson. Could you raise your hand, Matthew? Yes, Matthew's right there. That gentleman, if you'd like to learn more about the book club, uh, please feel free to go and speak to him. Now, it's uh, an honor to introduce uh, our speaker for today, who is Arthur Meltzer. Comes to us from Michigan State University, where he is professor of political science, political philosophy, and is the co-founder and co-director of the Symposium on Reason, Science, and Modern Democracy. He is probably the world's leading living Rousseau scholar, having published many articles and a, uh, a very uh, noteworthy classic book published by the University of Chicago Press on the natural goodness of man, Rousseau's system. Uh, and today he is going to speak to us on Rousseau and the cult of sincerity. Professor Meltzer. Uh, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me in the back? Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here, part of the Jefferson Center. And I would like to thank Professor Pangel for that kind introduction. Um, my topic today is Rousseau and the modern cult of sincerity. But let me begin by trying to convince you that you should be sincerely interested in this topic. Now, we are all of us engaged in the effort to know ourselves, to know what is good, and to move the former, ourselves, a little closer to the latter, the good. We are engaged in this effort not because we are professors or students, but because we are alive and human. But self-knowledge is notoriously difficult. And one of the greatest difficulties is formulated by Nietzsche in his well-known statement, one is always furthest from oneself. One is always furthest from oneself. The same point is made by an old joke. Not very funny. It goes, we, know, we don't know who it was who discovered water but we're pretty sure it wasn't a fish. I see you agree with me. It's very gratifying. <clears throat> so what does this joke mean? Why couldn't a fish have discovered water? The point of the joke is that you cannot see the things you are immersed in, the things that are all around you. That's why we are all of us furthest from ourselves. And this crucial difficulty, call it the immersion problem, gives rise then to a specific strategy for attaining self-knowledge. We can see and know ourselves best, we can see what is most distinctive about ourselves by getting outside of ourselves, by getting away from ourselves, through the study of other times and places. For example, through foreign travel, and especially through the study of history, time travel. Now, once you adopt this strategy of trying to know yourself through the study of history, then you are in a position to discover the particular importance of Rousseau. For Rousseau played so great a role in shaping our current selves, in creating the world of beliefs and sentiments that make us who we are, that one is almost entitled to say that we cannot know ourselves without understanding Rousseau. This is especially true 
if one is seeking the particular piece of self-knowledge that I want to pursue tonight. What I want to understand about ourselves is this. Why are we today so obsessed with sincerity? For the canonization of sincerity or authenticity, its elevation to the highest or most fundamental human virtue would seem to be one of the defining characteristics of our age. This has been the observation of a long line of critics. Now someone might immediately object that the goal with which we today are truly obsessed is not sincerity, but rather wealth or material success. But one of the strangest things about our society is while everyone chases money, few wholeheartedly believe in it. Almost every American will tell you that Americans are too materialistic and that they sell out too easily. Somehow we have now all internalized the old critique of bourgeois culture that used to be the proud preserve of alienated artists and intellectuals. Today, we are all critics of our own lives. And the primary content of this self-critique, the content of this self-dissatisfaction is this. We feel a fear that we are or are becoming other-directed, phonies, role players, hypocrites, conformists, and hollow men that we all give in, sell out, and suck up. And on the positive side, when we ask ourselves what it means not to sell out, a little voice within us always gives the same reply. Be true to your inner self. Our deepest longing is to break free of our anxious inauthenticity and finally just be ourselves. Other ages called upon men to be holy, be brave, be patriotic. We say, be yourself. If the modern age had a theme song, it would be, I gotta be me. That is our obsession with sincerity. But we are so immersed in this ideal of sincerity that we don't see its uniqueness. Again, the immersion problem. It feels so natural to us that we tend to assume that all people always shared this concern. But the truth is that it is a rather strange, historically unique ideal. Indeed, you cannot find a single writing moral, religious, or philosophical prior to Rousseau that elevates sincerity in this way to the highest good. So, why do we have this obsession with sincerity? That's the question I want to ask. Now let me make a first stab at an explanation. A first stab that will prove inadequate and thus prepare the way for a somewhat different approach. In seeking the explanation for any major feature of a society or a culture, it is always best to begin with a method that one might call regime analysis. This method, which stems from a long tradition dating back to Plato and Aristotle, is to try and understand the major characteristics of a given society or a given culture in terms of the fundamental political principles structuring that society. So in the case of America, the principles of equality and democracy. This is what, for example, Tocqueville does in his analysis of democracy in America. So, can we answer our question? Can we understand the rise of the ideal of sincerity as a direct outgrowth or expression of the principle of equality? Ultimately, I think the answer, as I said, is no. But it is likely that our love of sincerity springs from more than one source 
And certainly one of these sources is our hunger for equality. So let us very briefly consider this regime explanation before moving beyond it. The virtue of sincerity calls upon us to admit and reveal our true inner feelings. And this means especially the feelings that we would otherwise want to hide. That is, the base and shameful feelings. After all, there is no virtue in revealing your noblest impulses. Thus, sincerity furthers equality. Sincerity serves equality because it encourages self-unmasking, self-debunking. It encourages the public renunciation of the pretense to superiority. Sincerity would have all of us declare, beneath my public mask, I too am weak. So in this way, sincerity serves equality. Moreover, taken to an extreme, sincerity is even more leveling, more egalitarianizing. On television talk shows, for example, we see a daily parade of reformed drug addicts, child molesters, necrophiliacs, and other moral unfortunates who, speaking loquaciously of their crimes, end up receiving the admiration of the audience for their courageous openness and sincerity. The more horrible their secrets, the nobler they are for revealing them. <laughs> Thus, on a certain level, the worse they are, the better they are. Heroes of sincerity are to be found only among the most unfortunate or depraved. In short, the ideal of sincerity, when taken to an extreme, has that transvaluing power, made famous by Nietzsche, which, by which established hierarchies and established inequalities are not only subverted, but reversed, turned upside down. But notwithstanding all of this fine service that sincerity renders to equality, it does still seem to me that one can not rest with this kind of regime explanation of the ideal of sincerity. That is, one cannot adequately explain the rise of this ideal as a direct outgrowth of the principle of equality that stands at the core of our regime. I believe a new kind of analysis is needed here. My primary reason for saying this is that the ideal of sincerity did not first arise from within, from within our liberal democratic regime with its ideal of equality, but rather it arose as a reaction against our regime, a reaction against our regime. As is well known, sincerity and the great attack on hypocrisy and insincerity was first embraced by intellectuals and artists who, standing proudly outside and against the dominant bourgeois culture denounced it for its rampant hypocrisy and conformism. In other words, what is crucial for understanding this virtue of sincerity and our obsession with it is to see that it is not only a new virtue, but it is a new kind of virtue, a countercultural virtue, if you like. And it is distinguished from other virtues in at least two ways. First, as we've just seen, it's not a direct virtue embodying the ideals of the society, but rather a reactive or countercultural virtue embraced out of revulsion for our direct traits and primary impulses. Sincerity was canonized not because it expressed the regime and its principles, but precisely because it seemed so clearly missing from the regime. Secondly, sincerity is, or at least in its origins, excuse me, secondly, sincerity is, at least in its origins, not a society-wide virtue, 
stemming from the principles or conscience of the regime as a whole, but rather it is a specialized virtue, being the discovery and the unique property of the artists and the philosophers, the intellectual class, which stands in an adversarial relation to the culture at large. And if we search back in history to find the first emergence of the ideal of sincerity in the full modern sense, if we seek the intellectual or philosopher who first elaborated this ideal, we come eventually to Rousseau. So here we are at last, back at Rousseau, as someone we need to understand in order to understand ourselves. <clears throat> so let's ask him our question. Mr. Rousseau, why are you so obsessed with sincerity? And I think he would give a two-part answer to that question. The first part concerning the unique prevalence of hypocrisy or sincerity or insincerity in modern or bourgeois society. And then in the second part, he would exp he, the second part concerns the unique goodness of sincerity. So let's consider each of these things in turn. But let me first pronounce the ritual caveat that must precede all public discussion of Rousseau. Rousseau is a thinker with many different sides. And although I believe that at bottom they all fit together, there is no denying that on the surface they all seem to contradict. So what follows is an account of one side of Rousseau, the deepest side, I believe. But I do not deny and cannot deny that there are many places in his works where he seems to take a very different view of things. End of caveat. <laughs> OK, so part one, the unique prevalence of hypocrisy in modern society. Rousseau would say that if he seems to be obsessed with insincerity, constantly railing and fulminating against hypocrisy, that is only because hypocrisy is the most fundamental and characteristic feature of the men of his time. Insincerity or hypocrisy, in his view, is the modern disease. Why should this be so? According to Rousseau, this hypocrisy is certainly not natural or historically universal. On the contrary, it is Rousseau's famous claim that men are by nature good. And that goodness involves, among other things, sincerity as distinguished from hypocrisy. Thus, their present hypocrisy must be due to certain corrupting social institutions and social conditions. It is not, hypocrisy is not a natural vice, but a historical one. According to Rousseau, our hypocrisy is the inevitable result of the fundamental structure of modern society. To understand this, let's begin somewhat further back. <clears throat> Rousseau adopts but radicalizes the theoretical individualism of the Enlightenment thinkers like Hobbes and Locke, the thinkers who he is attacking. So he, he adopts, he agrees with their first theoretical principles and especially these principles of individualism. That is, he argues that human beings are not by nature social, but are rather solitary and fundamentally selfish. These human beings can, however, be artificially transformed and made into social beings by properly devised political institutions. And by properly devised, he means institutions which are able to engender in this naturally selfish being, able to engender within him sympathetic fellow feeling, and above all, a patriotic love of the common good. So to the extent 
that a society succeeds, as for example, ancient Sparta, which was his favorite example. To the extent that a society succeeds, as did ancient Sparta, in thus radically denaturing human beings and transforming them into militantly patriotic citizens, then these men, these citizens, will live happy, healthy, and free of hypocrisy. But Rousseau is the first to acknowledge that this kind of transformational politics is extremely difficult and also extremely dangerous. Now, it is Rousseau's view, however, that you can't avoid that difficulty and that danger if you want a political uh, arrangement that is healthy for human beings. But in Rousseau's view, the defining characteristic of modern societies and of the modern Enlightenment philosophers um, whose uh, principles those modern societies embody, the defining characteristic of these societies and philosophers is precisely their conscious renunciation of this very difficult and dangerous effort to transform men into citizens in the way that the ancient Greek city-states like Sparta did. Modern or liberal or bourgeois societies attempt the experiment of leaving people the way they are by nature, which is to say, as selfish individuals. Leave them as selfish individuals, and let's see if we can't unite them simply by showing them that cooperation with others is in their own selfish interest. After all, the more selfish people are, the more they feel the need of things, especially if by selfishness you mean a kind of needy, grasping, acquisitive selfishness. So the more selfish people are, the more they feel the need of things. And the more they need things, the more they depend on other individuals to supply them with those things. And the more they depend on others, the more they must be willing to serve those others so that those others will serve them in return. So the crucial modern claim then is that selfishness of the proper kind, what later was called self-interest rightly understood, actually fosters sociability and, and a stable social bond. But in Rousseau's own view, so that, that was the view of, of modern society and modern philosophy, in Rousseau's own view, this grand modern experiment has shown itself to be an unmitigated disaster. He agrees that materialism, individualism, and selfishness can indeed be used in this way to hold people together in society through bonds of mutual self-interest. But such a society will have the precise and unavoidable effect of forcing its members to become phonies, actors, and hypocrites. And the reason for this is beguilingly simple. The only reason why it is possible to generate sociability from its opposite, from selfishness, is because there is a contradiction within human selfishness, a contradiction. The more I am selfish, the less I love others, but the more I need them. Thus, the more I care only about myself, the more I am driven to seek the service of others. This elemental contradiction of human selfishness is what creates the modern character, the other-directed egoist, the other-directed egoist, the person who is prevented by his selfish need to use others from ever being himself. Let's think about this a little more. Each individual in this system is compelled by his very selfishness to appear just and benevolent towards others so that they will help him and give him the things that he needs. But because he is selfish, he never sincerely desires to be this way for its own sake. 
The same thing that makes him need to appear moral, his selfishness, makes him dislike being moral. In short, among selfish but mutually dependent human beings, it is necessarily bad to be what it is, necess what it is necessarily good to seem. In such a society, there is a systematic and unavoidable gulf between seeming and being. And this is why it becomes psychologically necessary that all men become phonies, actors, role players, and hypocrites. In sum, the modern commercial republic, generating sociability from selfishness, necessarily creates a society of smiling enemies, where each individual pretends to care about others precisely because he cares only about himself. So this is the first half of Rousseau's answer to our question. Why is he, and we in his footsteps, so obsessed with sincerity? His answer is, that for the reasons just given, hypocrisy is everywhere. It is the universal and essential characteristic of the man of our time, the modern bourgeois. And indeed, since Rousseau, this concept of bourgeois hypocrisy and the irritable tendency to find it everywhere has been a staple of Western literature and philosophy. Now, before going on to the second half of Rousseau's response to our question, let me pause to reformulate, in light of what we have just seen, what I think is unique about the modern preoccupation with hypocrisy and how this is traceable to Rousseau. Hypocrisy is not new. It has always existed. And the disapproval of hypocrisy is not new. That has also always existed. Think, for example, of the probably the most famous document condemning, pointing to and condemning hypocrisy, the Sermon on the Mount. But in earlier denunciations of hypocrisy, this vice is regarded as a moral problem of the individual. It is regarded as a natural human weakness like cowardice or immoderation. By contrast, in Rousseau and in the view prevailing after him, hypocrisy is regarded not as a moral problem of the individual, but as a social problem. It is seen as a widespread deformity of character systematically produced by the evils of modern society. Consequently, hypocrisy in the modern understanding is necessarily, a, as a, what I called before, what I called it before, a countercultural concept, indicting the existing social order, and the attack on it has more the character of social criticism than of moral exhortation. Furthermore, because this vice is blamed on society. The specifically modern concept of hypocrisy tends to go along with the view that only the bohemian intellectual, who is defined by his stance outside and against society, can free himself from and so recognize this deformity. And this, in turn, leads to the view that the intellectual has the unique ability and therefore the unique duty to act as the conscience of society and to denounce its hypocrisy wherever and whenever he sees it. So in sum, Rousseau and those who followed him were obsessed with hypocrisy because of the new prevalence of this vice, resulting from the rise of the bourgeois state, and because of their perceived duty as intellectuals to denounce it. And since Rousseau's time, this duty has been very well fulfilled, producing a torrent of anti-bourgeois attacks on hypocrisy. Now, as I said, there is a second part to Rousseau's explanation for his obsession with sincerity. 
If the first part points to the unique prevalence of hypocrisy in his time, the second gives new arguments for the positive good of sincerity. And so we turn now to that second part. Part two, the goodness of sincerity. Now this second part is indeed a necessary addition to the first because blaming hypocrisy does not automatically lead to praising sincerity as the highest good. The mere fact that hypocrisy is prevalent and even that hypocrisy is bad by no means proves that sincerity is the most important virtue. For example, in the aforementioned Sermon on the Mount, there is a very famous attack on hypocrisy, on hypocritical piety. But this, does, this attack does not lead Jesus to a praise of sincerity as such. Jesus' message was not to go among the people and say, be yourself, be sincere. There is no suggestion in the Bible, for example, that a sincere non-believer could justify himself before God by emphasizing his sincerity. Similarly, look at Shakespeare or Moliere. We find, again, much emphasis on the phoniness of men's claims to virtue and nobility. But the opposite of hypocritical nobility is still taken to be genuine nobility, not sincerity as such. Thus, Rousseau, and we after him, is doing something fundamentally new when he makes the seemingly obvious move from blaming hypocrisy to praising sincerity as such. And what is new is that he is not praising, as the opposite of the hypocrisy that he is blaming, he is not praising sincere piety, or sincere justice, or sincere generosity. He is praising sincerity itself, regardless of content. In other words, Rousseau is the first to define the good as being oneself regardless of what one may be. And that is a radically new position, a position which is at the core of his and our unique obsession with sincerity. So we need an explanation for this, this positive mood, this, po this positive praise of sincerity as such. Now, to defend this new view is the point of the second part of Rousseau's answer, which consists of a defense of the goodness of sincerity as such. But this argument actually brings us into the most fundamental level of Rousseau's thought, for his defense of sincerity is really a consequence or a byproduct of his whole new understanding of human nature, his comprehensive redefinition of the human self. According to Rousseau, the fundamental principle of human nature is self-love, self-love. The innate inclination to delight in, preserve, and actualize ourselves. But this claim is certainly not new. Many earlier thinkers had taken such a view. The crucial issue is, what is the self that we love in this way? What is the human self that we incline to delight in and preserve and actualize? Here is where Rousseau will give us a new answer. Aristotle, for example, makes the famous statement, man is a political animal. And by this he means that the true human self is a public or a communal self. That a human being cannot be himself by himself, that he can truly realize himself and come into his own only by performing his function within the larger political whole, only by being the part of the whole that he is. Plato maintains that our truest self is our reason or mind, and that we actualize ourselves most fully 
through the act of philosophic contemplation. St. Augustine holds that our highest good and our truest self is God, and that self-love, fully conscious of itself, is the same as the love of God. Rousseau rejects all of these earlier accounts of the human self. He argues that the true foundation of the human self is not God or reason or the community, but rather the elemental self-consciousness of the individual. In every act of awareness or perception, I am always simultaneously aware of the fact that I perceive. Let me say that again. In every act of awareness or perception, I am always simultaneously aware of the fact that I perceive. And furthermore, in thus perceiving that I perceive, I necessarily perceive myself. Therefore, there is a self-awareness which necessarily accompanies every act of awareness as such. And Rousseau calls this the sentiment of existence. It is the sheer awareness that I am, that I exist. And it is in this elemental self-consciousness that he locates the true human self and the foundation of our being. Somehow a human being exists not through his relation to God, not through his relation to the idea or essence of man, but through a relation to himself. Our being is our presence to ourselves, our sentiment of existence. Now let us plug this new understanding of the self back into the theory of self-love from which we began. The fundamental human, human inclination is self-love, as we said, which impels us to preserve and actualize ourselves. We want, as fully as possible, to become what we are, to realize ourselves, to become as alive and actualized as possible, to really live. Rousseau's new definition of the self has the following meaning. The true way to actualize oneself is not through the love of God, not through philosophic contemplation of the cosmos, and not through participation in the political order, but rather through withdrawal from everything else and communion with one's inner self. In a word, through sincerity. So here, then, is Rousseau's argument for the positive good of sincerity. As we can see now, it is not merely an ethical argument, praising the morally virtu virtuous character of sincerity, nor is it a political argument about the social usefulness of sincerity. Rather, it is an argument issuing from the deepest claims regarding the nature of human existence. Rousseau argues that sincerity is the highest good in life because it is the essential path to genuine selfhood and self-realization. What piety is for St. Augustine, what contemplation is for Plato, sincerity is for Rousseau. It is the unique means through which we draw closer to being and make ourselves most real. Now let me elaborate this point by distinguishing five fundamental characteristics of the new Rousseauian self and showing how each of these changes and each of these fundamental characteristics leads to the canonization of sincerity as the royal road to self-realization. Number one, because the sentiment of existence is, complete, is a completely internal phenomenon, the true self is emphatically private. Contrary to Aristotle, the real me is not my social self or my communal self. It is not what I am in other people's eyes, 
nor is it my role and participation in the community, my public activity, my citizenship and membership. The real me is the one that is there when I'm alone. At least if I know how to be alone and how to commune with, my, with, with myself. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're alone, but you think about, in, in, your, in, your, in your retreat, you think about nothing but what other people think of you, um, then you're not alone in, in the sense in which Rousseau is speaking. Now, of course, Rousseau knows that the public world of honor, power, and status seems to us more real and more important than this communing with ourselves. But he endeavors with all his force to convince us that this is a deadly illusion, that the public world is an alienation from the true self and not a fulfillment of it, that the private world of feelings and intimacies is actually the more real one. Rousseau consciously strives to subvert the public and political world, to make people more withdrawn, inward, intimate, self-absorbed, introspective, and sincere. In short, he replaces patriotism with sincerity. Number two, for Rousseau, the true self is not only not the public self, the point we just considered, but it is also not the rational self. Contrary to Plato, we are not our intellect, our mind, but rather our feelings. For the ground of our being is the sentiment of existence, which is a sentiment, a feeling. For a human being, to be is to feel. As for reason, in Rousseau's view, it is a recently acquired and rather unnatural faculty. It may indeed be the most impressive or the most powerful of our faculties, but it is a not, not a very deep part of us. That is, it does not, first of all, control our behavior. And more importantly, it's not the ground of our being or our existence. Therefore, we do not actualize ourselves by reasoning or contemplating reality, but rather by communing with our sentiments and feelings. From the standpoint of Rousseauian selfhood, it is less important to be true to reality than to be true to oneself. So in sum here, Rousseau replaces the ideal of wisdom with the ideal of sincerity. <clears throat> Number three, the true self is not the moral self. Rousseau knows, as I mentioned earlier, that human beings, though they are by nature solitary and free, they have the capacity, a strange capacity, to invent laws, contract obligations, create ethical and religious duties, and then force themselves to comply with these. Civilized human beings are to a very great extent self-overcoming animals who will conquer and repress their spontaneous inclinations and their natural selves in the name of certain ethical ideals. We human beings can make ourselves into moral beings, into persons of character and principle. Now, Rousseau's attitude towards this phenomenon is complicated. He sees it certainly as socially salutary, more than salutary, absolutely necessary for a healthy society. And therefore, he spends much time admiring it. But ultimately, he sees it as unnatural. The true self is the spontaneous self, not this invented and forcibly imposed moral character. The real me is the one that remains when I let go, when I stop trying when I just let it be. I truly find myself when rejecting all the strenuous talk about my higher self and liberated from shame and from guilt 
I just freely observe and sincere and sincerely acknowledge all that goes on within my soul. I must be myself regardless of what I may be. So again, the true me is accessed through sincerity. Number four. <clears throat> My true self is not primarily what I have in common with others, my share of universal human nature, but rather what is particular and unique to me. For in nature, only the individual or the particular is real. Everything abstract, everything general and universal is a human creation, indeed a falsification, a distorting imposition on reality. Thus, everything in myself that I have in common with others probably derives from the alien influence of society working on both of us. It does not really come from me. But on the other hand, everything in me that is particular, unique, and idiosyncratic is more likely to derive from my true inner self. Now, one consequence of this aspect of his understanding of the self is as follows. If my truest being were something universal, like participation in the universal nature or essence of man, then I could come to recognize and understand myself best through a kind of rational knowledge. And then this Delphic imperative to know thyself, which I began my lecture uh, discussing, then know thyself would mean know human nature and study it rationally. But if the deepest thing in me is unique, then I can only know myself personally. And the whole enterprise of rational self-knowledge must be replaced by each individual's introspection and sincerity. So philosophy is philosophic self-knowledge is replaced by autobiography and introspection. Fifth and finally, just as the Rousseauian self is not universal, but rather particular, so also it does not have the character of a form or a formal cause. The elemental self-consciousness that is the ground of our being, does not have any particular form or idea or essence. It is a pure sentiment of existence. It doesn't have any quality. It is a pure awareness that we are without any specification of what we are. Thus, the human self has the character not of a form, something with qualities, but, ra but rather, as it were, of a source or a wellspring. And so self-realization does not mean, as it used to, arranging one's soul in the proper order or being in conformity with the formal essence or the objective nature of man. Rather, self-realization means being in touch with our source, connecting with our wellspring, being online. For Rousseau, being oneself does not mean corresponding to oneself, but rather coming from oneself. And thus it means sincerity. For the sincere person is precisely he who always makes his true self his source and his origin. He's always coming from himself, whatever it is. In sum, Rousseau radically reinterprets the character of human existence, arguing that the true human self, rooted in the sentiment of existence, is private rather than public, sentimental rather than rational, spontaneous rather than moral, unique rather than universal, and originary rather than formal. And each of these changes, in a different way, makes sincerity the key to self-actualization or genuine selfhood. And this fact 
together with the new prevalence of hypocrisy in the emerging bourgeois order, explains why Rousseau became the first to elevate sincerity as such to the highest good. And I believe that it is fears of hypocrisy similar to Rousseau's and also a conception of the self in watered down form akin to Rousseau's that also lies behind our own idealization of sincerity. Thank you.